Unitary executive theory, sometimes called the divine right of presidents, is a theory that adds extreme views the American president as the sole arbiter and executor of the American government, the embodiment of the people's will, to whom the law and the government is nothing but a tool. As the old expression goes, no one is above the law, except, of course, the president. So, where and when did this theory come from? Does anyone of importance actually espouse this kind of stuff? And what are some of its arguments? Also, why might some people be drawn to these arguments? Well, there is some limited historical reference, such as a decision in the 1920s when the Supreme Court declared the president had the right to sack his own appointees. We probably not consider that to be an indication of what was to come. The popular birth of the more extreme view dates back to the unfair prosecution of an innocent man, a gentle soul who was undermined by the Department of Justice and then railroaded out. I am, of course, referring to Richard Nixon. As a recap for those who, like myself, have parents who were young around this time, the Department of Justice was investigating the Watergate break-in headed by Special Key Prosecutor Archibald Cox. To shut down this investigation, Nixon demanded his attorney general to fire Cox. The attorney general resigned. The deputy attorney general got the same order and resigned after receiving the same order. Robert Bork, upon being the third in line, decided to be the president's hatchet man. Bork would go on to become a major figure in the conservative legal movement, for example, playing a role in the founding of an obscure organization known as the Federalist Society. During this time, he was eager to explain that Nixon had been completely in his legal rights to shut down investigation into himself. Some people may vaguely remember Bork as something that the conservative senators and newspaper cryptically referenced during the Kavanaugh hearings, often under the term Borking, which is not to be confused with boofing or any sex act. The term Borking comes from the fact that Bork would have also been a Supreme Court justice if Ronald Reagan had had his way. Having first been successfully nominated to the Court of Appeals by Reagan in 1982, Reagan would soon attempt to nominate him to the Supreme Court. His nomination to the Supreme Court was blocked by Democrats in the Senate for that small hatchet man thing, as well as a record that more than suggested hostility to abortion and civil rights, enough so that Joe Biden actively opposed him as an extremist. Completely random name drop here, but there was this odd guy named Bill Barr who had gone to play a role in this legal movement, first developing a sterling reputation for his brilliant idea of pardoning everyone under investigation from the Iran-Contra scandal, effectively nuking the ongoing congressional investigation. So ever since then, this wonderful man has been an obscure figure and will probably remain so. On February 5th, 2020, the Senate of the United States lent this theory its support. The acquittal was not surprising, what was surprising was the reason many of the senators gave. Not that the president hadn't committed a crime, but that it hadn't mattered. Many co-signed that Trump had a perfectly good phone call and was totally within his rights to hijack aid money and attempt to use the Ukrainian government as his version of the plumbers. It didn't take long after the acquittal for public reprisals to fall on witnesses in a way that would make Erdogan blush. Not only going after some of the people who had reported him, but also including their family members in the federal government for his purge. Since then, the Justice Department has seen and will likely continue to see many departures for anyone who was involved in any investigation of any of his allies. Ditto for any watchdog who makes a foolish decision to protest any of his decisions or actions. But that's been an ongoing trend from day one, so... Yeah. This one line is the subject of contention. Executive power is not defined in the Constitution, and historically, this has been interpreted as having power over appointments with some broad ability to direct government agencies in specific directions through executive orders, generally through a more public-facing manner. However, another interpretation of the executive power is that covers all execution of laws, that any action of the federal government is in effect an extension of the president. This just by coincidence happens to me that the president does it, it's legal. If an act that was against the law was committed by the president, the president simply decides that that law doesn't apply, and as he is the law and the government, 
That would be a correct position. This could be relevant in far-flung, abstract, theoretical situations, such as the president shutting down investigations into himself and cronies, or something bizarre like his associates not testifying to Congress and just flat-out refusing subpoenas, or deciding to block the execution of transferring aid money and requesting foreign powers spy on his opponents. Purely theoretical things. Some other things that might be legal involve pardoning people for cash, lying to Congress, using the Justice Department to crack down on his opponents. Hunting human beings for sport on the White House lawn. Ignoring any laws passed by Congress. Tax fraud. Embezzlement. Using the FBI to spy on his opponents. Directing government agencies to pay your own businesses. Punishing states that vote against you. So, there's a few not great effects to taking this interpretation of the law. So why is it that people support it? Well, some people like the taste of boots. This isn't the whole story, but it plays a part. About a quarter of the population believe in the need for a daddy to take control who will tell them what to do. The idea of parliamentary government filled with grey bureaucrats just does not have the same sex appeal. Perhaps the most common idea touched upon by advocates of the unitary executive theory is the need to contain the hydra that is the federal government with numerous independent agencies. The federal government today has more parts than early government American history, including a number of agencies where long-term appointments are the norm. To many people, including pretty much every foreign country, this is hardly unusual. But one of those figures was to act in a malign way. Nobody elected these guys. And if they're independent, then they're responsible to nobody. This tends to fall under the umbrella of being a public servant, but who's to say what that is, if not the president, a directly elected official? Now, to be fair, J. Edgar Hoover existed, which lends some legitimacy to this claim. But here's a few problems. Nobody loves bureaucrats. At least, normal people under normal situations don't. Things like the ability of employees to report their bosses have a significant impact here, as do various organizational safeguards. At the end of the day, it's well impossible to abolish an entire agency, as Republicans have a habit of promising to do. By comparison, none of this is true when it comes to removing a president. Under a system where the president is subject to no laws and the entire government reports directly to him, the only method of oversight is impeachment. This either means accepting that laws just won't be enforced, or going, oh, the president was impeached? On to, what is it? The sixth one? Seventh one? Meh. Unless impeachment becomes the default response to all presidential errors, this system is bad. Also worth noting is you can already impeach anyone in the federal government, including the head of an independent agency. In other words, all that tying them to the will the president does is make it harder to remove bad actors so long as they're associated with the president. The head of any government agency will have their own politics, and some of that may get reflected in policy. However, it would be rather unusual to have a broad conspiracy spanning multiple government agencies. But to the level that this exists, it is far lower than giving these same powers to the president, who may be more than a little bit tempted to now use vastly expanded powers to his own benefit. It should probably be worth noting that there is the argument that you need a president who's above the law to thwart a scheming bureaucracy and corrupt judiciary. Unfortunately, this is the basis of a liberal democracy. So if you're a fan of countries like, say, Turkey or Hungary, great. Then there's the Xi Jinping school of thought, that by using your expanded power to crack down on corrupt officials only, then there's really no need to be worried. But here's the problem. You can expand the definition of corruption to pretty much everyone. And if you only crack down on opponents, it's simply a more effective way to perform a purge. Indeed, this is part of why a liberal democracy is increasingly part of the dictator's sheep. You can not only get rid of your opponents, 
but make yourself more popular in the process. Another idea that comes up is that the Constitution only meant for there to be a legislative, judicial, and executive branch, and never shall these meet. Then some radical left-wingers on the courts created this unknown idea of an agency reporting to Congress, roughly a century ago. The perchant for those proclaiming to be originalists to ignore judicial precedent means that ignoring a century worth of law doesn't really mean that much. But it's also worth noting that early as the country's founding, there were fights over the radical bureaucrats at the first national bank. Additionally, it's worth noting it would be difficult to disentangle legislative versus executive powers. For example, the ability to raise tariffs, historically always a legislative ability, was granted to the president on the grounds of national security for emergencies. One might wonder why Congress didn't give themselves oversight on this one. Except for the fact that Congress actually did. It was the Supreme Court to decide congressional vetoes, even though they had been standard for 50 years, were illegitimate as they reflected a form of executive control. This had the effect of removing the ability of Congress to simply vote down the tariffs the president had raised, something that might be relevant today. Kind of back to the topic of troublingly authoritarian undertones, we have the idea that the president needs these powers for security. After all, what freedoms can exist if a people are conquered? This is used to justify the idea that the president needs these powers to provide security at a moment's notice. On the domestic front, it's hard to think the president needs control of the Justice Department to keep the country together. This same separation of the state from its leaders is pretty much the norm in every other democracy. This is useful, however, for cracking down on dissidents who threaten the president. This might seem like a stretch, but already nobody's like Alan Dershowitz when going on to the Senate floor, pushing the idea that if the president views his re-election as a national security issue, then really he's justified in doing whatever he needs to do in order to boost his own election chances. Notably, this argument was used to justify how Trump could invade Iran without congressional approval. Even though the War Powers Act explicitly prohibits it, and the Constitution explicitly gives Congress control over the declaration of war. This interpretation has been pushed by Bill Barr in 1991, advising H.W. Bush on the first Gulf War, as he stated again in an interview in 2001. So, yeah. Projecting current ideas onto the past is hardly unheard of, and can be done with legal documents just as easily as any historic document. This kind of begs to ask why unitary executive theory became popular, for whatever reason, following the impeachment of Nixon, particularly, though not exclusively, within the conservative movement. This could stem from the conviction that the government as a whole is inherently bad. Embracing this theory means you can claim that the administrative state, in and of itself, is unconstitutional. It might also have something to do with the fact that Republicans have created an ideological ecosystem dedicated to undermining presidential accountability. Governmental oversight has often been at odds with Republican governments. A media sphere that exists for ideological defense may try to push ideas that punish whistleblowers and seek to excuse presidential misdoings by claiming this is justified by authority. So, we have an ahistorical, unprecedented legal theory with troublingly authoritarian undertones, being referenced by nobody's in the Office of Legal Counsel, the President's Legal Defense Team, and it keeps being promoted by conservative justices, generally under Republican presidencies for whatever reason. In short, everything is probably fine. Now, in case things aren't entirely fine, voting can work sometimes, so you should probably register for that. Protest is valuable. They're rather difficult under current circumstances. The ACLU is always looking for more support, so maybe support them if you believe in this is important. Also important is being literate to these issues. So that you know that somebody who is speaking proper legal language calmly and dressed in a suit can also be pushing somewhat deranged theories for how society ought to be governed. And towards that end, sharing this video would be great, or upvoting it. If this video hits 10,000 views, it will likely be a top search result for people who come across this idea. So maybe that would be something. 
At the very least, it would likely be a good counterpoint to the current list of Federalist Society videos explaining why unitary executive theory is such a great idea. I hope you enjoyed this, or at least found it interesting. And if you did, I'm planning to make some more videos examining the politics and philosophies of other areas. If you want to hear more, it'd be great if you could give me a follow.